I wanted to uh, lift up one of our missionaries this week. Gosh, let me put my little paper here. Uh, I know I say this every week, but the, anybody that goes to Wales is some of my favorite missionaries. And I hate to say this in this church, because Mark and Terry are here, but the only, the only temptation I would have to be a missionary would be to go to Wales, because I love Wales, and we've done our ancestry, and I'm from northwest England, right on the Scottish border, right on the Welsh border, right, right up there. That's where all the manlies wandered around in a fog of confusion for years. And I'd love to go back there, but we have a missionary there now. Richie and Mich Missy Oric are in Wales. And uh, those of you who've been here a long time, remember they were originally called to missionaries to Wales uh, and, and did a good work, but were called back here in 2012 to work at Cherry Street Baptist Church, which I think is in uh, Baptist Bible College in Springfield. That's where it is. God made it clear this was just a time and a season for them. They were needed, and they went back to Wales in 2016. Wales is a wonderful, lovely country. Some of the best speakers and almost all the best singers you ever heard of are from Wales. Uh, they're just lyrical. It's a land of song, and the men's choruses are famous the world over, and they have preaching competitions, and unfortunately, they're usually won by people who are not even Christians. It's just considered an art in Wales. But... The Welsh people, we went there in 2010 on our uh, anniversary, the only time I've ever been out of the country, really, and I was just charmed by them. And uh, the Oryx are doing great work. There's a lot of buildings and churches that are down to eight or ten people, and they're trying to revive closing churches and restart them and planting new ones and assisting in all sorts of areas in local churches. So we're, we're glad to be part of the work of Wales. You remember the great 1905 Evan Roberts revival in Wales that just shook the whole United Kingdom. We'd like to see that again. We have supported uh, Richie and Missy again their second time in Wales since January 2018. So our hearts go with them. Go to uh, Proverbs 21. We're on last week's, next week's lesson. I appreciate you just hanging with me. I've never done that in my life. Mark assures me it's okay, but he loves me and he says nice things like that, even if they may. I, I really hate to mess that up. This was supposed to be last week's lesson. It's a good lesson. We'll get through it. And the title of the lesson is Cardboard Christians, False and True Witnesses. You know I have a ministry although I haven't had much recently of trying to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, don't do that unless you are very uh, serious about looking into their material and training because they are dangerous, dangerous people. So it's not a casual thing. But one of the great concepts they have is a verse in the Bible that says, who is that faithful and true witness? And they say it's the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower Association of Brooklyn, New York. And that is the external earthly pays taxes brick and mortar Holy Spirit for the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And so the, the concept of a true witness and the followers of Christ as reflections of he is the true witness and a false witness are central in uh, New Testament theology. But the truths of them go far back and we're going to talk about a key verse today about uh, Proverbs 21, 28. This is a short lesson. Mark and I were just talking about it. When I listened to these lessons years ago and tried to work them out, and we've done a lot more since then. Mark, Mark shines them up and tunes them up a lot more than they were back then. But you could hear in the uh, sermons that this was Sunday night material or Wednesday night material and time was running out. But you know what? When you condense something that good down, every word is packed with power. The Gospel of John almost is made up completely of one-syllable words. That's a skill to with power deliver in simplicity the truths of the gospel. And that's what we're going to study today, a great truth in a very simple verse. Proverbs 21, 28 says, A false witness shall perish. This is a verse I use a lot with the Jehovah's Witnesses, proving to them that the uh, Watchtower organization is a false witness. But the man that heareth speaketh constantly. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of material in that one verse. A lot of people might not. This is an older class. You probably do. Do you remember Art Linkletter on the television? He was a very good man. He was a very good man. He was saved later in life, but he was a very positive thinking type person and helped in a lot of charities. But then there came a tragedy in his life and in his family. It drove him to his knees, and right after that, 
he was in a hotel lobby in San Francisco. It was time to pray, and he confessed, frankly, a few weeks before, he just would say, I, I really can't pray. I'm not an outward praying. But what he had been through opened his eyes to his real condition. He was able to pray God's blessings uh, through Christ on everybody there. And he said, you know, before God afflicted me or allowed me to be afflicted, I'd been a cardboard Christian. That's a good word for somebody who is all facade and nothing real on the inside. Formerly in the South, in the Bible Belt, which is apparently gone, uh, cardboard Christians were very common in little towns like ours. You'd join the church to get good business deals. You'd get baptized to keep your wife happy. You would do all sorts of religious things. That's pretty well gone now, uh, but that was nothing real on the inside in our lives. But with God in Christ, during that crisis, he had found and met and dealt with reality. The thing that people want more than anything at your workplace is to see somebody somewhere somehow that operates in reality, that is not putting on a show, that's not trying to build up an organization. Uh, the great hunger of the hearts of your neighbor, my neighbor, your friend, my friend, your coworker, my coworker is reality. Now I can say that because I was not raised in a Christian home. I was you know, 24 when I was saved. I wasn't saved because I was thinking, I wish God would convict me of the truth of his word and the reality. I didn't know any of those words. I wanted somebody that had strength for living and that had a hope for tomorrow and that had connected to the 440 wire of truth. And, it, and, and I, I, there was people in my medical school class that they were, they were either connected to reality or they were crazy. And I, after a few years, I said, they're not crazy. They've got something I don't have. You may be uh, lost, but I'm not dumb. I know that they have something. I can tell that. They laughed when I cried. They cried when I laughed. The great need of our neighbors and friends is to get past fakery and past phoniness and past uh, play acting and hypocrisy and engage with the living God, the uncreated creator, uh, the truth incarnate, and his truth with true truth with real reality. The need of the church is to evangelize uh, in what we enjoy and operate from a position of integrity and reality. That people will watch you. That's the great benefit of living in a little town. <laughs> You're, you witness here every day. That lady that checks you out at Weigel's, uh, if she talks to you for three minutes, she said, well, you know my cousin Fred's uh, third cousin's dog groomer. I said, I sure do. He's a great guy. You know, I just We just start talking. Everything's like a spider web. If you can live for Christ, which is hard, which we're trying to do, it makes a tremendous difference. This verse cuts that concern of our neighbors in the watching world right down the middle. Uh, it's a short lesson, so we're going to do two points instead of three. Half the verse deals with a false witness, and that's everywhere. And half the verse deals with a true witness, and that's a rare commodity. Uh, that's a good thing to have in good friends and good role models, good pastors, which we've had, thank the Lord, and uh, good missionaries that we've dealt with. So the first thing I want you to see of our two-point lesson is the fatality of a false witness. A false witness shall perish. If you don't wear your seatbelt, you might perish. My dad worked on me all through the... 1970s and finally he, I, I just just enjoyed I was mean I just enjoyed saying oh I'll just fly around the car I'll be fine no you can die it is fatal not to have reality to be false to be phony to be a cardboard Christian you've heard that in the New Testament in Matthew 7 verse 21 not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven Many will say, you know, there's a say-so salvation and there is a no-so salvation. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Sounds good. Then I'll profess unto them, this is surprising to me the first time I read it. It still surprises me every time I get to it. I never knew you. Absolutely never knew you. As a matter of fact, Depart from me, ye that work in equity. Everybody, Mahala Jackson, one of my favorite singers, you remember her? One of, uh, one of her best songs to sing was Everybody Talking About Heaven Ain't Going There. That's exactly right. 
uh, and some people that don't talk about it will be there before everybody else. Do you see the verses in Matthew? Number one, there is false praying. Lord, Lord, not everyone that saith unto me, someone that's saying something to God is either in reality or ostensibly directing their thoughts and their words to heaven. There is false praying, Lord, Lord, people who knew they should pray and seem to be praying and seem to be orthodox in their praying. If they prayed to him, they're praying to the right person. So there's a lot going on here, but it just falls flat. Number one, there's false praying. Uh, it gets worse. Number two, there is false preaching. Have we not prophesied in thy name? That is preaching and many fill pulpits across uh, God blessed America who have never been born again and who are preaching the Reader's Digest are a lot worse these days than the revelation of God from heaven. Judas was a preacher, but he was false and he was lost. Number three, not only is the fatality of a false witness dangerous in your life, in my life, in your community, in my community, in that it can involve false praying and false preaching, but even false power. This is a warning for our Pentecostal friends and Baptocostal friends. We, uh, we love power. We love for Christ to show up in reality and truth, and we pray for it. And, uh, you know, a good preacher, they said of Martin Lloyd-Jones, his preaching was logic on fire. We like the on fire part. Uh, somebody said about some preachers, they said they uh, get so wound up, people just come to stand and watch them burn. They just light themselves on fire. But casting out demons here is false. Uh, did they cast out demons? No. But you see, they said that they did. They thought that they did. But we know from the New Testament that that's a simple party trick for a band of demons. Uh, the, you, you, the demons are clever, diabolical scheming. They will allow you to think you're dealing with them or scaring them, and they'll be right back. Do you remember the story in the Bible that uh, cast out demons, this person from his house, he cleaned and garnished his house, he went to a big meeting, he jumped and shouted, and I'm not against meetings, and I'm not against jumping and shouting if God wants you to do that, and get, you get excited. Uh, he cleaned and garnished his house. The demon went out. So far, so good. He went out the front door, round to the back, pried open a window, and came in with more seven deadly demons than at the first. They were just playing with him to get an advantage. This is falsity. Uh, that man's state was worse in the end than the beginning. That's what happens when you deal in falsehood. That's when you, you open a door that you don't even believe in, and guess what? It's real, and they're playing you. You're not controlling them. Fold up the demons, strike back the tent, only to circle the block and come back in more wicked strength and power. Many who say, I have hit the 440 line, I have power in my spiritual realm. They're just filling themselves and their followers, and their eyes will be open soon enough. That's serious. That's kind of very scary. Number three, and no, excuse me, number four, not only false power is part of the fatality of a false witness, but there is false performance. Matthew 7 says, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now that's, uh, you can see all the opportunities for ministry and even a good local church could be used as excuses for not knowing Christ, not hearing Christ, not following Christ, and you hope that the smoke of your activity will obscure uh, the reality from the eyes of God. It will not. Uh, the Bible says, all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God sees where we don't see. Many lost people, fakes, one good thing about being coming from a non-Christian home is I didn't have even the integrity to pretend to be a Christian, so I wasn't fake. I was just lost and sinful. Uh, fake, serve in the church, in the nursery, in the choir. Let's be fair. A lot of them teach Sunday school. They might teach auditorium classes in Baptist churches. Uh, activity, this is good, does not always equal reality. It should. Your activity should flow from the reality of a new heart and a new life in Christ. Uh, but it may not. All of these things, you say, well, I tithed, I went to all the meetings, but they never knew Christ. Guess what? A false witness shall perish. Reality is the coin of the realm uh, two seconds after you die. You have to have reality. Jesus says to these false witnesses, depart from me, I never knew you. You say, what's well, so sad? They were saved for so many years and they fell back. No, 
You know that verse, 1 John 2, 19, they went out from among us because they were not of us. If they'd been of us, they would have doubtless remained with us, but they went out from us that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. Manifest, all things that are made manifest by the light. Well, Jesus Christ is the light. Their lives did not endure. You say, well, you're judging them. No, the only thing that endures is God's word. The human work never endures. The enduring work is a mark that God's in it. Uh, the, Adrian Rogers said, the faith that fizzles before the finish is flawed from the first. That's pretty good. I thought that was good the first time I heard it. He's exactly right. I better say it again. Joyce always asks me. The faith that fizzles before the finish was flawed from the first. And because you say, well, you're judging me. No, I'm judging. If you claim God's involved in it, it should endure. Not perfectly, but biblically it should endure. And if it doesn't, then God's not in it. And, and you're trying hard. I'm not blaming you. We all tried to impress everybody for years. And thank goodness you'll eventually fall flat. So maybe we can help you like someone helped me just fall flat here. Uh, you know what? That's what they did. What they did, they called the ground and means of righteousness. God calls it inequity. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had to lay on him the inequity of his soul. For we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You've studied that, you know, menstrual cloth and uh, old war wounds and uh, just terrible, terrible filthiness. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags in his sight. And Dr. Rogers in this message, I don't know if he said it here, but he said it all the time. The worst form of human badness is human goodness when presented as an alternative to the shed blood of Christ. And that's what you and I were tempted to do. Uh, I hope we didn't do that. But anyway, God as a substitute for the new birth. So Proverbs 21, 18 again. Excuse me, Proverbs 21, 28. A false witness shall perish. That's bad. That's sad. That's where you and I were headed. God mercy uh, sent his son and sent people to talk to us and a gospel to believe. But the second part is a little bit longer and it's much more cheerful. It says, but the man that heareth speaketh constantly. I don't know about you, but immediately Romans 10, 17 comes to mind. Faith cometh by hearing, but not just the radio, not just positive thinking, not just the inspiration channel, not somebody on TV that says, my faith is important to me. So far, so good, but faith in what? Uh, that's like my fork is important to me, but if you use it to eat grass, it's not going to help you. Pork chop will help you. Your fork is not the object. It's where is it being stuck. That's the idea. Uh, what are the three marks of a faithful witness? What are the marks of reality in the realm of religion? First thing, it says in verse 28, the man that heareth speaketh constantly is there has to be a listening worship. No man knows God. No man is dealt with reality or prepared to serve the Lord until he hears from God, from heaven. And God intends for us to hear. Uh, he's been giving his message through his prophets and his pastors and his teachers for years from the word of God. A true Christian relates to hearing from the God of heaven. He that heareth. Francis Schaeffer is one of my favorite apologists. And his one of his very first books was, He is there and he is not silent. That's a good idea. This world thinks uh, that we have to create God. I had uh, dinner three times with Adrian Rogers. One of them was at the Apple Barn in Pigeon Forge, and that's what he, he said. And he just said these things. He's sitting there eating his hush puppies, you know, just like everybody else. And he said, there's only one great question. I thought, well, I better put my hush puppy down and listen to this. <laughs> there's only one great question. He said, did man make God or did God make man? And, you know, that's the only alternative. If there's not a God who is there, then he's a theological, sociological, anthropological construct to just kind of explain things that we no longer know. And so the answer is to go to college and get a Ph.D. in astrophysics, and then you might, no, no, that's exactly wrong. A true Christian relates to hearing from the true God of heaven who wants to speak and wants to, to, for us to know, he that heareth. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That hearing from heaven, uh, from the God of heaven, 
is part of the listening worship which characterizes the reality of a faithful witness. He knows those that hear him. You've read that in John 6 and John 10, and it's wonderful. And, and it brings immediately to my mind, you know, the summer of 85 when I went to that Bible study every Thursday. And I went by myself because I wasn't a Christian. I went, they invited me, but they didn't always go with me after that. Matter of fact, almost never went with me. And I didn't even tell anybody what I was doing. I was just on the one side of Memphis, on the one side of I-40, and over here was the VA Medical Center, and here was Bellevue Baptist Church. And uh, students were walking around everywhere, so I would just kind of walk around with them, and then I'd just make a cut to the right and head over to that church. And if they asked me what I was doing, I'd say, oh, well, I got a clinic at the VA this afternoon, which I did. So it was just me. You know what? God was speaking to me. And he said, and I told you, when he was uh, speaking that summer, from the word of God, the pastor that brought the message, um, the Holy Spirit said to me, you said, did he audibly? No, it wasn't audibly, but it was absolutely definite. That's true. And I was like, who said that, you know? I had no background in the Bible. He said, that's true. And, I, and you know what? In my mind, it was kind of like, okay, that's true. Now what are you going to do with it? Well, I think I'll keep coming, <laughs> and I kept coming, I kept coming. And you know what, that's not any uh, uh, help to me. That's the God that speaks, and he also unstops the ears to hear and pulls the scales and melts the cold heart. He's on both sides of this. When you read John 6 and John 10, if you want to be a Calvinist, you can prove it there. If you want to be not one, you can prove it there, because it's the same thing. The people that God's uh, finally bringing to himself are the people whose hearts are melted and turned to him. And we, I can't explain that, but it happened. I can tell you exactly how it happened because it happened to me, and it happened to you too. God's working, and we had to hear, and we had to respond. That's amazing. Um, Jesus stood before Pilate. Pilate wanted to argue. Pilate said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Listen to this. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. That's what happened to you. Hopefully a lot earlier than it happened to me, but better late than never, uh, a voice was heard, and it's a human voice normally, a pastor, a preacher, a friend, a soul winner, and the Holy Spirit one way or the other says, that's true. And you can see it in people's faces uh, when it works. It doesn't work all the time because you reject for many years or God finally comes and shows up and just starts melting everything that's the idea. Mark that statement. A faithful witness hears and hears his voice. This book is the voice of the Son of God. You must hear him through this book. I'm so glad that those people invited me because it's easy to believe the wrong thing. You know, the people that followed Sun Young Moon and all these crazy religious Jim Jones and all, they were sincere people. They just got so tangled up. It was deadly. It's absolutely lethal in the matter of salvation and the handling of sin and eternity to go the wrong way. This book is to us the voice of the Son of God. You must hear him through his word. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Has to be there, absolutely. It's a powerful word. You know these things, but I'm going to go slow because they are worse, worth reading. Uh, in the matter of salvation, the power for salvation is from the spoken word of the God of heaven. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is as grass, the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withereth, the glory thereof fadeth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel came to you. That's the idea. Number one, this word, uh, a reality of a faithful witness, must be a listening worship. And that word talks about salvation accurately, and the Holy Spirit comes after you. Number two, power for completion. As newborn babes... Uh, desire ye the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Not only are you born, but you're fed. That's completely natural and normal. We're all pro-life, but we don't walk out of the delivery room after the baby's born and say, hey, man, pro-life. The baby's going, <clears throat> needs some milk, needs some help here, maybe a heat lamp, some blankets, 
uh, go ahead and you know stamp my foot into the registry of the of the uh, thumbprints. Uh, number one for salvation. Number two for completion. Number three for cleansing. Psalm 119 verse nine. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Thy word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 11. Number next, power for claiming. This is for living. Uh, it, remember, did you have the navigator wheel? Did that help you like it helped me? Uh, some, uh, na I think I told you a navigator, which is a college campus. It's a good ministry as far as I know. They sure were nice to me. I was lost. I lived at the Kappa Alpha House in University of Missouri in 1978. And this guy, I just still admire him going into some rotten old fraternity house. He just went up and down giving out little New Testaments. And I looked, you know, completely clueless. So he sat down and talked to me. And he showed me the wheel, the little memory wheel, about 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Galatians 2.20 about Christ being the center and prayer and Bible study and then fellowship and then something else. It was horizontal and it was, it was about 10 verses. And I mean, I was 17 or 18 years old. And he said, now you need to memorize this. So I thought, well, I guess I need, I don't know who you are, but I, I memorized it. I wasn't even saved for five or six years later. And I, I memorized them, and John 15, 7 is one of the prayer verses. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That, you see, that limits the power into what Christ said and his words, which to us come through the scripture. So that shows you the power. It must be a listening worship, not only for claiming, but for conquest. Um, well, I didn't write it down. Ephesians 6, 17 uh, is a verse for that. Number, counseling, prayer for counseling. Second Timothy 3.16, uh, let's see, that's all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What's right, what's wrong, how to get right, how to stay right, infallibly accurate and true. I appreciate counseling ministries. Uh, I, I support Mid-America Ministry in Memphis. Who is that man, John? Is it Adams? Uh, Adams that died He's the great nuthetic counselor. Anyway, they, they, they got all of his books and all of his papers, and they offer a degree in biblical counseling at uh, Mid-America, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and again, power for communion, and, and it's the same verse, John 15, 7. My, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will. It shall be done unto you. There is power in this book. You say, I don't believe it. I don't care. It's true. For, it, it happened to me. My mother lives in Memphis, Tennessee. You say, I don't believe it. Who cares? She didn't, poof, dissolve because you don't believe it. You just showed me that you don't, you're not walking in reality. Uh, reality is reality. This book is power to change lives, and I know it's because it ch changed my life. And you say, I don't believe that. Well, you're probably wrong about some other stuff, too. We're praying for you. <laughs> it's kind of funny that you're so clueless because you can't argue with that. You know what? A great method and in, in, in the, in the intentional method of bringing people to Christ and then to maturity in the New Testament is come and see. It's to be expected that there is such a change in our lives, and shame on us when there's not, and it's perfectly our fault, uh, that, that it's perfectly safe to say, come and see. Uh, when Jesus was gathering up all the apostles and the disciples, you know, he didn't sit there and argue saying, well, this was mentioned in Ezekiel, and the idea, that, now the original concept, he said, come and see, come and see. And of course, he was a rabbi, so that they lived with him, they ate with him, they just inhaled his truth. The mark of reality the power is in this book. The word, the thoughts, the voice, the mind of God. Here's a quote. The mark of reality is that you are hearing from God. Paul said we are witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost which God has given to them that obey them. A preacher that preaches from the word, and we appreciate good preachers, and, and everybody should learn to speak well if they have a speaking gift, but the power is not from even their good speaking, it's from what they are speaking, it's the word. Now you know I love uh, history, biblical and Christian history, and I guess I love Spurgeon best of all, but uh, in London in that day there was at the city temple a good preacher, a good man, 
uh, they didn't always agree, but he was a fine Christian named Joseph Parker, and he was the pastor of City Temple when Spurgeon was at the great Metropolitan Tabernacle. And it was said, and not in criticism, but just because I think Spurgeon was one of the great two English-speaking preachers in the world, that if someone came to London and went to both, they'd say, what do you think about Parker? They'd go, my soul, what a preacher. What about, did you get to hear Spurgeon? My soul, what a savior. And not that Parker didn't preach about a savior, but, so, but the very best of preachers evaporate when they get behind the pulpit. <laughs> I always watch these John MacArthur conferences, and they have a button for, I never thought about this. We could have this, I guess. But they have a button to raise and lower the pulpit. And he said, he said, you know, a good preacher is to stand behind the pulpit or teach everybody and give the word of God, the powers and the word of God. You're behind it. He said, this pulpit shall not be moved. Except, except for up and down. <laughs> well, it's a, he's talking about that the power is really not from the, even a gifted speaker. It it's should be projecting through uh, the pulpit, which is the center of a, of a biblical church, which the Bible is the pillar and ground of truth. So preacher, word, you forget the preacher, you hear from God. Number two, the reality of a faithful witness is not only a listening worship, but a living witness. Again, Proverbs 21, 28, our verse for the day. The man that heareth speaketh constantly. You know what? You speak what you hear. You, you're, our lives are all put together by all the contacts with people that have talked to us for years. If I have a little illustration that explains to you why you should take your statin medicine when you've had two heart attacks and you don't want to do it because the fellows in Granger County say it'll kill you, I have to have the right little joke or concept or something to try to move the needle on you. And you know what? If I have a good one, I heard it from somebody. I didn't make it up. You may be able to make things up. I don't make anything up. I just remember silly stories and sayings, and that's good. Well, this is not a silly story or a saying. We heard from God from the Word, and when we repeat that and, and filter it through our lives and put it into our language and our vernacular and our experiences, you're still... The power behind that is the original word from heaven. We speak that word again. We dare not speak for God, it says here, until we have heard from God. But having f heard from God, we dare not be silent. So you can't win. You can't just sit there and say, I'll not do it either way. No, he that's not with me is against me. This is, this, and you're not going to be able to do that. We are to speak for the Lord when we have heard from the Lord. And a great way to do that is your testimony. I, I go to evangelism classes. We're doing things like that. I mean, I, there's a book that they use at Mid-America that Gray Allison wrote. He's dead now. I've been reading that. You know what? Whenever these things happen so fast in my life, you come up on somebody that's not a Christian, I don't ever have time to remember the outline or the little monomic or something. Some of them I do. But a lot of them, if you, if, I'll just tell you this because my mind gets scrambled and yours might too. If you can't remember what to say, just say, did I ever tell you what happened to me back in 1985? That, that's just tremendous. We went to Jacksonville, the Bible conference one time, and they had somebody that had a real good ministry with Muslims. And I thought, oh, he must have studied some verse I haven't heard of. And he said, no. He said, uh, I just tell him, big smile, put my arm around him, and tell him, have I ever told you what Jesus Christ has done in my life? And nobody's going to say no. They'll hear it. And, you, and, and if you can tell them, and you can paint yourself bad enough, which isn't hard, and paint Christ glorious enough, which is easy, then they're going to think, I need that. Now, they're not going to say it. I didn't say it in 1985. I just went back to my room and thought about it, and they might do that too. We dare not speak. We are to, are to speak for the Lord when we have heard from the Lord. Here's another good quote. Many powerless preachers are speaking today, but not what they've heard from God. They've never heard from God. So they speak from their heart alone, there are liberal denominations that have just jettisoned the Bible from public speaking. And, I, and sometimes we're getting ready for church or something and watching the different programs. There's a lot of good ones, but some of them are in these beautiful cathedrals and gorgeous. Uh, the music's very wonderful, but they get up there and it's just whatever they heard last week on the TV news. I think, what a waste of time. Uh, that's the idea. 1 Corinthians 15.3. We're talking here about there must be a living witness. Uh, it says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. 
Now that can be theological, but that can also be, again, your testimony. I'm, I'm giving to you what I received from heaven through a good witness, a gospel witness, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. John 8, 26. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he which sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard of him. Even Jesus Christ spoke to us just what he heard from the Father. And I'm not ashamed to say, you remember, I remember Pastor Cross said this years ago. And, and you know what? That's fine, because he got it from the Bible, and so it's going to be it's going to be good. And you can say that same for, for Pastor Mark or anybody. You can, just, you can bring that up. Uh, this is the difference in the rest of our life. And those of you who, I love apologetics, but the older I get, the more I'm beginning to see that apologetics really has more role in strengthening believers in these dark days than it does in trying to argue people out of all sorts of presuppositions on the college. If someone wants to talk, you should have an answer for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. But I have 99 out of 10 questions come from believers who need to be strengthened and need to be encouraged. That's the idea. What's the difference between lawyers and witnesses? Well, as far as I know, we don't have any lawyers in here. Lawyers argue a case. Witnesses tell what happened. You know what? I'm not that good at arguing a case. I, when I was a medical examiner, we had to do court testimonies, and I would take 25 milligrams of atenolol, this beta blocker, before I went in there because those lawyers scared me to death. If you said, my name's Emmett, you'd be begging for mercy in a few minutes because they'd twist it into a knot. they just absolutely cut you down to size. Well, I couldn't do that. If I even tried a few arguments, they, they were trained lawyers. But you know what? A trained lawyer is at no advantage over a Christian with a, a ringing testimony. You have reality. Witnesses cannot be shaken by. So you didn't really see your husband kick the dog. Yeah, I was there. I saw it. The dog, here's the, you know, I was there. The dog yelped. We took it to the store. We locked our husband out and threw eggs at him. And he's, he's no, I, I was there. Well, I don't believe it. It doesn't matter. You know, that, that the word of that witness stands. That's the idea. We're not called to be God's lawyers, or most of us, but as witnesses and speak what we have heard from God. Uh, you shall be witnesses unto me. That brings to mind a lawyer argues a case, but a witness tells what she has seen and heard. And we can do that, thank goodness. Every time I hear that, I think, well, I can do that. I just tell my story. You know, everybody, uh, John MacArthur said uh, his God was sports. He was apparently very good at sports before he came to Christ. And then he was called to preach and he didn't want to do it, and God had him in this terrible car wreck, and he skidded down the road and had to be in the hospital for weeks getting skin grafts. And he said while he was there, uh, God got hold of him and told him to, that he was going to preach. And he did. He said, I don't want to skid down the road anymore on the back of my jeans and peel off the entire layers of my skin. Uh, you cannot be a witness till you've seen and heard. In other words, you connect with reality. And people can tell whether you connect with reality, especially if you point yourself out as the villain of this story. It wasn't anything you did right. You, you, you're the problem in this story, and, they, and everybody starts nodding, because we know that. We know many Christians are phony because they never speak. Now, some people are babble. I'm a talker. I like to talk. I have to watch my schedule every day because I could sit there and talk when patients in my office all the time. And saying when another talker comes in, my nurse goes, oh, no, we're never going to get to eat lunch. <laughs> but uh, I'm not talking about that. Even people that are not by nature big talkers, if, if something happened, if, if you won the Reader's Digest sweepstakes, $7,000 a week, never get out of your bathrobe, drive the golf cart down to the mailbox and pick up your check and drive back, you would tell somebody. I would. I'll say, you know why I don't work anymore? Because I won the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. It wasn't a lottery. I just ordered the Reader's Digest, and now I'm set for life. And you know what? I would be a tell if the mailman, hey, did I ever tell you what happened to me? <laughs> You would tell everybody. You can't have the reality of God in Christ and be permanently, per perpetually silent, not, not, not trying to change your personality. R.A. Torrey, one of my favorite people, said, I would like to know what right any man has to call himself a follower of Christ if he's not a soul winner, in the sense that he never says anything about what happened to him. It's not fishing 
If you're not fishing, you're not following, he said. How can any man be a follower of Christ if his priorities are not our priorities? Now, everybody's got a way they try to reach people. You have your, your circle, I have mine. If someone's sick or they want to talk about how terrible the news is or how in the world are we going to fight China and Russia and Ukraine at the same time or some kind of they're worried and they're upset, and uh, I always say the same thing. I, and I, they may or may not be Christians, but I kind of pin them by saying, Aren't, well, it's a good thing we're Christians because we're not here for long. By death or by a nuclear bomb or some virus, we're not here for long. And they go, and a bunch of them go, yes, thank God I trusted Christ years ago. And the other ones go, yeah, I guess that's true. And now they were like, let's get out of here. This guy's wacky. <laughs> well, at least I know where they stand now, so that's fine. Well, uh, reality lasts. God's work in the life of a believer is an enduring work. It's real. God will keep you. It's real enough that you can testify about it. This is the reality of the faithful witness, not to fickle and fallible men and their ideas in some book you read, but to the faithful and unchanging God who has sent us the truth of the word of God. We are to testify to him and also what he did in our life. That's the connection that people want to hear. We're to be an exclamation point instead of a question mark. And if you are a cardboard Christian perpetually, you will perish. Cardboard burns up really fast in a hot fire. And uh, like somebody said, I don't remember who, that we need to trade religion for reality. Religion stinks. You know what religion is? I'm really good. I'm better than you. And God thinks I'm pretty great too. He's going to let me just kick the door of heaven and walk right in. That just, everybody goes, oh, good heavens, let's get out of here. This guy's nauseating. You trade religion for reality. Well, next week, see how it says lesson four on your lesson? Next week is lesson six. Just, you don't show up, you don't get to know what we're going to do. And then we're going to go back to the people of the Bible after that. Uh, Lord, thank you for the truth of this cardboard Christianity and help us not be like that and help us share what you did in truth and reality in our life to other people. And hopefully they'll come to Christ like we did. Amen.